Before we begin, I want to share with you one of my favorite new podcasts. Hosted by my good friend Michael, one half of the True Crime Guys podcast, his new podcast, Strange and Unexplained, is, well, just that. Stories of true crimes, conspiracies, and mysteries that are super strange and still unexplained. Here's Michael to tell you a little bit more about Strange and Unexplained. What happens when life is stranger than fiction? Or when the antagonist wins because we have no idea who they are? Or when the so-called perfect crime is committed and society is left dumbfounded and petrified? Well, we make a podcast about it and we talk about it, right? You know, crimes that are strange, crimes that are unexplained, for instance. Those two things are some of my favorites. I'm your host, Michael, and I want to introduce to you a brand new podcast brought to you by True Crime Guys Productions. It's called Strange and Unexplained, and you guys can find this new show anywhere you listen, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play. It's there. So if you're looking for a laid-back, self-aware podcast that doesn't take itself too serious, I think we might just tickle your fancy. So give Strange and Unexplained a listen today. And remember, be strange, just don't be a stranger. This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. People decide to get married for many reasons. Of course, there's love. But not everyone who falls in love chooses to tie the knot. Usually, there are other reasons involved for making such an important commitment to honor and cherish one person, forsaking all others, for the rest of your life. Sometimes it's the desire to have a family. Or it might be because you're done sowing your wild oats and want to settle down to a more peaceful and grounded life. Maybe it's just the idea of having a partner to go through life with sharing both the good and the bad times side by side. But what happens when your reasons for getting engaged are based on a whim, or because you feel pressured, or just because you feel caught up in all the wedding hoopla before you really have time to think through such a major decision? Well, then the marriage may be in trouble from the beginning. In this episode of Till Death Do Us Part, a young woman says yes to a proposal, but soon starts having doubts. Instead of being honest about her feelings and halting or postponing the wedding, she goes through with the big day. The decision she'll make soon after realizing she's made a big mistake would be a shocking act of cruelty. This is the story of newlyweds Jordan Graham and Cody Johnson. Twenty-one-year-old Jordan Lynn Graham posted a picture of her engagement ring on social media in December of 2012. The caption, punctuated with multiple exclamation marks, read, He proposed, best early Christmas present ever. The he in question was her 24-year-old boyfriend, Cody Lee Johnson. They had been dating for a little over a year. Some of their friends would express surprise at this news. Although the couple had been dating for a while, Cody and Jordan just seemed so different from one another. And to be honest, some of their friends believed the relationship to be mostly one-sided. Cody seemed to be much more smitten with Jordan than she was with him. Cody and Jordan met in Kalispell, Montana. Kalispell, a town of just under 20,000 residents, is located in northern Montana. It sits at the gateway to Glacier National Park. 1,500 square miles of hiking trails, waterfalls, pristine lakes, and gorgeous vistas in Montana's Rocky Mountains, and stretches all the way to the Canadian border. Cody was a popular and outgoing guy. 
He was said to be an all-American kid who loved the outdoors, enjoyed the sport of shooting, but was especially fond of cars. A car guy, Cody loved working on engines and was the first to volunteer to help a buddy tune up or repair his car. Cody's love of cars naturally led to time spent four-wheeling in the steep hills and valleys that were in abundance near his hometown. Cody was fun-loving and loved to make people laugh. He had lots of friends as a result, and everyone considered him one of the nicest guys they knew. After graduating, Cody eventually began working at a company in Kalispell, Nomad Global Communication Solutions. While Cody was an only child, Jordan was the oldest in her family. She lived with her mother and stepfather and her younger half-brother Michael, who was six years her junior. Jordan, described as quiet and somewhat reserved and shy, began working as a nanny after high school. Jordan and her family were committed Christians. Church was very important to Jordan, and most of her social activities revolved around church activities. She had friends, but was not especially popular. Perhaps it was due to her shy nature that she wasn't more socially active, but Jordan seemed more comfortable when alone or with young children who she cared for as a nanny. Jordan's parents wanted her to wait until she was 18 to start dating, and that didn't seem to bother her. Her mother believed that a good Christian girl didn't need to pair up with a boy unless they were considering a future together. Jordan also believed, as a Christian, that sex should be reserved for marriage. So she wasn't in any hurry to date anyone exclusively, and instead spent time with a few girlfriends or in co-ed group activities. In 2011, a friend introduced Jordan to Cody. Cody was attracted to the pretty brunette right away. She wasn't extremely talkative but he liked how she was naturally pretty without makeup and didn't dress provocatively to get attention. Cody had been wanting to meet a nice girl he could date seriously, and Jordan fit the bill. And besides, Cody could be social enough for both of them. He was a real people person. As it became clear that Cody was seriously interested in her, Jordan had one request. She wanted him to start attending church. Cody, although not much of a churchgoer previously, was happy to attend services and events with Jordan. Before long, he could count more friends among the congregation than Jordan had. But now that Jordan and Cody were a couple, his friends became her friends and vice versa. Then in December of 2012, Cody popped the question. Jordan said yes right away, and at that point, there should have been nothing but good wishes from their family and friends. But there was a problem. Jordan's friends, if they were being honest, were simply shocked that she'd agreed to marry Cody. From their perspective, Jordan didn't appear to be in love with Cody. As a matter of fact, some would even say that they didn't even think she was particularly attracted to him. Although why she wasn't, they couldn't fathom. Cody was a nice-looking guy, fun and charming. Also, he adored Jordan. He would have done anything to make her happy, they said. And yet, Jordan didn't return his ardor. It was pretty obvious almost awkwardly so, that there was no chemistry in the relationship, at least not on Jordan's end. One of her friends would say that she never observed the couple hold hands, kiss, or flirt with each other. Jordan also avoided spending time alone with Cody. Whenever he planned a date, Jordan would find a way to bring along another friend, or even her little brother Michael, who adored Cody. If only Jordan did, they thought. So Jordan's friends weren't sure why she agreed to marry him. Maybe there was more to the relationship than they knew. Or perhaps, Jordan just wasn't comfortable with public displays of affection, some reasoned. She was somewhat of a conservative girl. That must be it, they thought. So while they still had their reservations, they wished her well and congratulated her on the engagement. Cody's friends weren't as easily swayed. They'd also seen the strange dynamic between their friend and his girlfriend. At first, they believed that Jordan was just quiet and shy. She also didn't spend much time around Cody's friends, so they didn't really know her very well, they admitted. It felt to them that she avoided hanging out with them, but Cody's closest friends believed they knew enough about the relationship to be against it. They didn't spend a lot of time with Jordan, but when they did, she was, quote, antisocial and unfriendly, they said. It was easy to see that Cody was in love with Jordan. He worshipped her, as one friend described it. But Jordan was cold to Cody, no matter how much he tried to make her happy. One of Cody's good friends, Cameron Fredrickson, told ABC News 
that when Cody shared with him that he was going to propose to Jordan, he was not supportive. Quote, I had a conversation with him telling him to reconsider. It just didn't seem like a happy, loving relationship you'd normally see. It was just very awkward. She was very distant and reserved, Fredrickson said. But Cody could not be persuaded against marrying his sweetheart. His mother, Sherry, said that her son was ecstatic about the engagement. Her boy was happy, and that was all that mattered to her. Sure, Jordan wasn't that affectionate, but she didn't expect that she would be in front of his mother. She gave Cody and Jordan her blessing, and they began the wedding planning. Or rather, Jordan did the planning. She threw herself wholeheartedly into the planning of the wedding, like any future bride might. This was a good sign, her friends thought. Jordan had never seemed more happy or animated as when she was trying on wedding dresses, choosing her wedding colors, or going wedding cake tasting with her girlfriends. But in the days just before the wedding, Jordan started to get cold feet. She began texting friends, saying that she wasn't sure she was making the right decision. She wondered if she should call the whole thing off. Her friends chalked her doubts up to normal wedding jitters. They told her they knew Cody loved her and were sure everything was going to be great. It might even be a good idea to express her nervousness to Cody, they suggested. He might be a little nervous too, and having a conversation about it might confirm their love for one another. Then they can enjoy their wedding day without reservations. It's doubtful that Jordan ever did have that conversation with her fiancé. At least, he never mentioned that she had expressed any doubts, and he never shared any concerns with his own friends. For all anyone knew, Cody and Jordan were both looking forward to their wedding and the life they would share together afterward. We'd like to thank Hask for sponsoring today's episode. Hask hair care products are used on more Hollywood film and television sets than any other hair care brand. That's because Hask offers good-for-you formulas that won't break the bank. Their shampoos, conditioners, deep conditioners, shine oils, and dry shampoos are made with clean ingredients and designed to treat and repair all hair types. Hask's Tea Tree Oil and Rosemary Invigorating Collection is blended with purifying tea tree oil and rosemary to help hydrate and soothe the scalp to refresh your hair and keep it looking healthy. It's great for those with a dry or irritated scalp and works gently to rid the hair of impurities, leaving your hair full of moisture and shine. My favorite thing about Hask's Tea Tree Oil and Rosemary Collection is it's infused with peppermint oil for that tingling sensation that really energizes my hair follicles. And you can get Hask's Invigorating Formula in shampoo, conditioner, 5-in-1 leave-in spray, or give your hair a really special treat. Use their deep conditioning hair mask. The Hask Tea Tree Oil and Rosemary Invigorating Collection and other Hask products are available on Amazon.com, as well as online and in-store at Ulta, Walmart, Target, and CVS. Hask is now hosting weekly giveaways for our listeners. For your chance to win Hask's weekly $100 prize pack giveaway, go to haskbeauty.com slash once. That's haskbeauty.com slash once. This episode is also brought to you by Rapid Lash. Rapid Lash Eyelash Enhancing Serum is an award-winning, clinically proven lash enhancing serum that cosmetically boosts the look of your lashes in as little as four to six weeks. In the pursuit of longer, fuller-looking lashes, We've been pretty hard on them. Mascara, false eyelashes, and eyelash extensions can all take their toll on your lashes, not to mention thinning lashes due to age, stress, medications, the environment, and other factors. Rapid Lash is formulated with six highly effective ingredients like biotin, amino acids, and pumpkin seed extract, all designed to moisturize, protect, and enhance the appearance of lashes. I love that it's ophthalmologist and dermatologist tested and safe for contact lens wearers like me. I just apply Rapid Lash once in the evening on the base of the lash line, and I've already seen an improvement in the look of my lash length and thickness in just a few weeks. Rapid Lash is available at CVS, Ulta, Target, and Walgreens for the affordable price of just $49.95. Or visit rapidlash.com and use the discount code RAPID30 to save 30% off Rapid Lash products site-wide and learn about their other products, Rapid Brow, Rapid Shield, and Rapid Renew. That's rapidlash.com and use the code RAPID30 to save 30%. Jordan and Cody got engaged in December of 2012 and set their wedding date for the following June. On June 29, 2013, 
Jordan Graham walked down the aisle at her outdoor wedding. It was held in the formal gardens of Woodland Park in Kalispell. She wore a strapless dress with a beaded bodice and a full satin skirt. She wore her hair down with a short veil affixed to a tiara crown. Cody beamed as he saw his bride arrive, but as Jordan began walking down the aisle, quote, she began bawling, a friend recalled. Many brides are overcome with emotion on their wedding day, but Jordan seemed almost despondent, a bridesmaid remarked. She composed herself as the minister began the ceremony, but Jordan didn't look at her groom, keeping her eyes fixed on the ground or to the side. She squirmed as she held Cody's hands when instructed to by the minister and barely looked at him as she recited her vows. It was a bit awkward to watch Cody all smiles while Jordan fidgeted at the altar, but some explained it as Jordan being a shy person who was uncomfortable being the center of attention. She came out of her shell a bit as the reception began. The bride and groom took photos with the wedding party. Cody hammed it up, posing for silly pictures with his best man and groomsmen. Jordan even got in on the fun when she posed laying across the arms of her new husband and his groomsmen as they held her aloft for the photographer. The couple even had an original song written for their wedding. Songwriter Elizabeth Shea penned the words that Jordan herself sang. The recording was played at the reception for their first dance as husband and wife. At the end of the festivities, Cody and Jordan left to the applause and well wishes of their guests. They spent their honeymoon night in a hotel in Big Fork. The next day, they returned home to Kalispell. Although they had already moved in together, as required by their church, the couple had agreed not to sleep together until they were officially married, so Jordan remained a virgin until her wedding night. But the next day, Jordan would call her friend and maid of honor, Kimberly Martinez, to confess that the marriage had not been consummated on their wedding night either. She would also confess that she now believed she'd made a huge mistake in marrying Cody. The day after Jordan Graham married Cody Johnson, she called a friend and told her she was, quote, having a total meltdown, unquote. She now believed she'd made a big mistake and, quote, wondered what the heck I just did all this for, unquote. Her friend wasn't sure what to say and told her just to give it some time. It was probably just all too new, and of course, she was just getting used to being a married woman. Jordan then sent a series of texts to her friend, Kimberly Martinez. Kim had stood up for her at her wedding, acting as her maid of honor. The texts Jordan began sending the day after her wedding were surprising, to say the least. I should be happy, and I'm just not, Jordan texted. I don't know if this was the right thing to do. So much happened last night. I just don't know. Kim responded, last night at the wedding or last night at the room? Jordan replied, being married and after the wedding. What happened after, Kim wanted to know. Jordan told Kim she'd rather not talk about it in person. Kim finally saw Jordan in person a couple of days later. Jordan came over, sat on the sofa, and just cried and cried, Kim said. She told her friend that the wedding night had been, quote, a miserable time. Neither one of them had enjoyed it. Kim at first thought she meant the first time they'd had sex with each other. But Jordan later admitted that they had not consummated their marriage that night. I didn't want to, and we just didn't. Jordan said. Well, that wasn't a great start, Kim said, but it didn't mean they didn't love one another. It was natural for Jordan to feel nervous, especially since it would be her first time with anyone. But Jordan, rather than simply being nervous, admitted to being terrified of having sex with her husband. Kim tried to assure her that things would work out and encouraged her to give it some time. Jordan finally went home, but continued to text Kim about the same issues and doubts over the next few days. One text read, I just know he's going to want to do stuff, and I'm not really wanting to, Jordan complained. The next day she wrote, I'm using the my period started spiel tonight. I freaking hope it works, because if I'm forced to do something, I'm going to freak out. Kim again told her friend to talk to her husband about her concerns. Jordan responded, I feel like it's my job to make him happy, even if I'm miserable. A week after the wedding, Jordan told Kim that they still had not had sex. Jordan began to panic that she wouldn't be able to make excuses for much longer. On the evening of July 7th, Kim got a text from Jordan about 9 p.m. I'm about to talk to him, Jordan wrote. I'll pray for you guys, Kim responded. Before signing off, Jordan wrote, but I'm dead serious. 
if you don't hear from me at all again tonight, something happened. Kim wasn't exactly sure what Jordan meant by that. Later, she got another text from Jordan. I'm going to go for a walk or something. Jump off a freaking bridge. I've lost it. Kim didn't know how to respond and was glad when she didn't hear from her again that night. She hoped she was just being dramatic. Cody was a good guy and obviously patient with his new bride, she thought. She was sure he could calm her down. She probably just needed time to adjust to married life. But Kim didn't know that Jordan had already decided married life wasn't for her and had taken things into her own hands. On Saturday, July 7th, Cody Johnson had plans to go kayaking and golfing with his new father-in-law, Jordan's stepdad, Steve. They had made plans the night before. But that morning at church, he told Steve he couldn't make it because Jordan had made other plans. Later that day, Cody met a couple of buddies for a quick lunch. He confided to them that he'd changed his plans after Jordan told him she had a surprise for him. Cody seemed to be in an especially happy mood. Cody's close friend Brad later said that Cody didn't specifically say so, but Brad believed the couple still had not slept together. He believed that the surprise Jordan had planned had something to do with this. The couple attended the evening service at Faith Baptist Church and afterward went with friends to have a bite for dinner at the Dairy Queen. A friend asked Cody what the surprise had been. He responded that it hadn't happened yet. Jordan and Cody left their friends about 8 p.m., that was the last time anyone saw or spoke to Cody. The weekend passed. On Monday, Cody didn't show up for work. He also didn't call his mother or co-workers to say he'd be taking the day off. It wasn't like him, they thought. Jordan told them that Cody had left for a trip with friends on Saturday and wasn't home yet. His friends thought that this was odd. Cody hadn't mentioned anything about going out of town, and he would have told his mother if he was leaving for a trip. The next day, Jordan said Cody still wasn't home. Now, feeling anxious, his mother called to report Cody's disappearance to the police. While Jordan remained calm and collected regarding the disappearance of her husband, his family and friends mobilized a search. They printed out flyers and posted them everywhere. They called anyone they could think of and also canvassed hospitals. Of course, they kept coming back to ask Jordan more detailed questions since she'd been the last person to see him. But rather than Jordan doing everything possible to help in the search, instead, she became irritable and acted annoyed about being questioned. At one point, as friends were questioning her about possible places Cody might have gone, she grew angry, pulled off her wedding ring, and threw it across the room. They were shocked at her behavior. On July 10th, three days after Cody was last seen, Jordan called a friend to tell her about an email she'd just received. She said it was from someone named Tony, who was a stranger to her. She read the email. It read, Hello, Jordan. My name is Tony. There is no bother in looking for Cody anymore. He is gone. I saw your post on Twitter and thought I would email you. He had come with some buddies and met up with me on Sunday night in Columbia Falls. He was saying he needed to be with buddies for a bit and take them for a joyride before they had to go. He said bye to me, and they took off in a black car for a ride. Three of the other guys came back, saying they had gone for a ride in the woods somewhere, and Cody got out of the car and went for a little hike. And they are positive he fell and he is dead, Jordan. I don't know who the guys were, but they took off. So call off the missing person report. Cody is for sure gone. Tony. Jordan's friend looked at her stunned. First of all, she was reading an email from a stranger about her husband being dead with absolutely no emotion. She wasn't panicked or crying but just read it as if it were a weather report. She asked Jordan if she'd reported this to police. Jordan said no. What are you waiting for, the other girl yelled. Get going, call the police. Jordan asked her mother to accompany her to the sheriff's office. When they arrived, Jordan went in by herself first and reported the email she'd received. She said it was signed Tony, and the email address was carmantony607 at gmail.com. She was questioned about the last time she'd seen her husband. She told them that on Sunday they had gone to dinner with friends. After returning home, she went into the back bedroom to receive a cell phone charger. When she returned, she saw Cody getting into a dark-colored vehicle that she noticed had Washington State license plates. Who were these people he left with, the detective asked. 
Jordan said she didn't know. She'd never seen them before. But later, she said she'd gotten a message from Cody telling her that some friends of his from out of state had come by and he was, quote, going for a ride with them, unquote. The detective asked Jordan more questions, but felt she wasn't being completely honest and told her as much. She stuck to her story about Cody leaving that night without telling her who he was going with, but then added, but he always told me this one thing. When his friends came to visit, he would take them to Glacier Park. The detectives were not convinced by Jordan's story, but set about to determine who this Tony was that had sent the mysterious email. Later that day, Jordan called some of the friends who were searching for Cody and said she wanted to search an area of Glacier National Park. She picked them up in Cody's car and drove them about an hour north to the park. On the way there, the others noticed that Jordan still didn't seem concerned. She was listening to the radio, singing along and dancing to the music while wearing Cody's sunglasses. As a matter of fact, one of her friends recalled, Jordan seemed, quote, the happiest she'd ever seen her, unquote, during the time Cody was missing. They reached the park and searched around a few hiking trails, but the sun had started to set, so they decided to return again the next day. The following morning, July 11th, marked the fourth day since Cody was last seen. Jordan, accompanied by some of the couple's friends and her 16-year-old brother Michael, returned to Glacier National Park to search. As soon as they arrived, Jordan began heading down one of the hiking trails called The Loop, a popular trail leading to steep cliffs that rewarded hikers with spectacular views of the Rockies, peaks, and valleys. Some of the others suggested searching areas closer to the road, but Jordan rejected all these options and led the searchers directly to a spot high up on the loop trail. She and Michael were the first ones to reach a clearing that was ringed by a low retaining wall. Beyond that, the land fell away into a deep canyon below, with a waterfall to the north and shallow pools of water covering the bottom. The drop was at least 200 feet or more. Jordan, followed by Michael, stepped over the retaining wall and toward the edge of the cliff. Jordan looked down and then shouted out to the other searchers that she could see a body below. They ran to look and indeed could see a figure lying at the bottom, although it was somewhat difficult to make out. They returned to the car and to the Lake McDonald Camp store to alert the park ranger's office. A ranger was dispatched to meet the group at the store, arriving about 8.30 p.m., Jordan told the ranger she'd located, quote, a dead body and led him back to the cliff. On the way back, she explained that they were searching for her missing husband and she believed they had discovered his body. The ranger commented that he found it odd she'd been able to find the exact spot where the body lay. Jordan calmly answered that the Holy Spirit had led her to the right spot. Her next statement would cause the ranger to be taken aback. Also, Jordan said, that area was a place that her husband, quote, wanted to visit before he died, unquote. While Jordan was with the search party at Glacier Park, a Kalispell police detective who'd interviewed Jordan the day before and lived in her neighborhood noticed something odd sticking out of her trash cans that had been put out for collection. He had been walking his dog on her street and saw the couple's trash cans full to overflowing. According to reporter Justin Franz from the Flathead Beacon, Detective Corey Clark discovered a stack of love letters, teddy bears, Valentine's, and part of a wedding dress. He took the bag and dumped it out on his own garage floor, where he proceeded to photograph the contents. He then placed everything back into the garbage bag and left it on Jordan's doorstep. It was too late in the day to try and retrieve the body from the bottom of the steep canyon on the day it was discovered, so a team was organized and set out the next morning. Along with investigators and park rangers, Flathead County Coroner Richard Sign was also tasked with climbing a rope down the steep ravine to make a preliminary examination of the body before it was moved. The body of a male was found floating in the water face down. He was clothed in a shirt and shorts. He was not wearing any jewelry, not even a wedding ring. A driver's license found still in his shorts pocket identified him as Cody Lee Johnson. Making their way to the body, they first noticed one shoe located about 150 yards downstream. Another shoe and one sock was found down a slope a little closer to the body. 
The coroner surmised that Cody had fallen down the cliff head first. There was an eight-inch gash on his forehead. There were also injuries found on both arms and scrapes and bruises on his legs, all injuries consistent with having fallen off a 200-foot cliff. He also had several broken ribs. The state medical examiner would rule Cody's death as the result of blunt force trauma. The ME equated the injuries to someone who'd been in a major car crash. His heart had also been torn open. One item found stood out to investigators and would later be a matter of some speculation. A piece of black cloth was retrieved a short distance away. It had been discovered lying in a feeder drain above where the body was found. Retrieving the body was difficult. A special helicopter team was called in to airlift it out of the canyon. As Cody's family and friends grieved the shocking end of the nicest guy they knew, his wife was posting a series of photos from their wedding day to Instagram. The caption, punctuated with far too many exclamation points, read, Miss you so much, Cody! Exclamation mark. Not a day will go by where I don't think about you! Double exclamation mark. You will live on in my heart forever! Double exclamation mark. I know you're in a better place now looking down on me! Double exclamation mark. You're my angel! Triple exclamation mark. Love you with all my heart and soul! Double exclamation mark. See you again one day! Triple exclamation mark. Soon after, Jordan remarked to friends, Now that we have the body, we can have the funeral and the cops can be out of it. Cody Johnson's funeral was held a few days later. As friends filed into the church to say their last goodbyes to Cody, they observed his wife sitting in the front row. She wasn't crying or even really paying attention to the service at all. Jordan was on her cell phone almost the entire time, texting. She showed no grief, one of Cody's friends recalled. She wouldn't even speak to Cody's mother. Sherry Johnson said she tried to console her daughter-in-law, but Jordan was not emotional at all and just stayed silent. Jordan's bizarre behavior at the funeral of her husband, who had died so tragically and mysteriously just a week after they'd wed, finally clinched it for Cody's friends and family. Some said they were instantly suspicious of Jordan, and others said that's when they were 100% convinced she was involved in his death. Several of them began calling police to share these suspicions. On July 16th, the team investigating Cody Johnson's death asked Jordan to come back to the police department to answer more questions. The investigation was conducted as a cooperative effort between several agencies. Because Cody was found in a national park, both the National Park Service and the FBI were called in addition to the Flathead County Sheriff's Department and Parks Canada. The Kalispell Police Department was also involved, since Cody had gone missing from that town. Jordan arrived at the Kalispell Police Department and questioned by an FBI agent. At first, she started to share the same story as before, that Cody had left with some guys she didn't know for a ride, and the email she had received from Tony telling her that he'd fallen to his death. She was questioned about her relationship with Cody. They'd already heard from friends that she'd had doubts about the marriage before and after the wedding. Jordan admitted that she, quote, didn't feel like she was on cloud nine, unquote, after the wedding. She minimized what she told her friends, that she should have never married Cody. Now, she told the investigator, she felt like, quote, they should have waited a while longer before getting married, unquote. The agent then laid out all the evidence they had collected in their investigation. First, they didn't believe the email from Tony that said Cody had slipped and fallen down the cliff. His injuries determined that he had fallen face first, indicating that he'd been pushed from behind. They also told her that the email was bogus, and they knew that it had been created using an email address on a computer located at her stepfather's home. They also had cell phone records that would prove she had been at Glacier National Park the day Cody went missing. At first, Jordan tried to protest that they were wrong or mistaken. Then they revealed they had photographic proof she had been at the park with Cody on July 7th. There was a surveillance camera positioned at the entrance of the park. It had captured video of their car arriving at the park with Cody at the wheel and her in the passenger seat at about 9.15 p.m. Caught in so many lies, Jordan finally confessed to having been at the park with Cody that day. And yes, she had been there when he'd fallen off the cliff, but she claimed it had been a terrible accident. 
After returning home from dinner, she and Cody had begun to argue, she explained. That's when they decided to take a drive to Glacier National Park to, quote, discuss their issues, unquote. Okay, I'm going to add a little ding, like an asterisk, each time she tells a ridiculous detail like this. I mean, who doesn't drive an hour to a park to discuss their marital problems? Once there, they walked on the loop hiking trail while they continued to argue. They ended up walking to the other side of the trail to an area that was very steep and proceeded down the rocks near a stump. While hiking down the steep slope, the argument intensified. At this point, they stepped over the retaining wall, separating the trail from the steep cliff drop-off. Such a great idea. Get in a heated argument with your spouse and take it to the edge of a frickin' cliff. Jordan then said she didn't want to go down that particular trail because, quote, I was afraid he could fall, unquote. He could fall, not they could fall. Hmm. Then, according to Jordan, Cody said, I could do it with a blindfold on. I could just put it on, take a step, and I wouldn't even fall. Okay, we have to pause here. The reason this statement is so odd, other than it being ridiculous, is that a piece of black cloth was found lying a few yards away from Cody's body, and detectives had wondered if it had anything to do with his death. Now Jordan brings up an odd detail about a blindfold? Prosecutors would later suggest that Jordan had somehow lured Cody to the cliff where he was blindfolded so he couldn't see when she was about to push him over. They thought perhaps she did so by promising a sexual encounter, something she had been withholding so far in their week-old marriage. Could this have been the surprise that Cody told his friends Jordan had promised to reveal on their hiking trip? Oddly, she would never mention the detail about the blindfold again and denied that the piece of black cloth was anything she knew about or recognized. Okay, back to her story. They're on the cliff, still arguing. At that point, Jordan says she tried to walk away from Cody. She claimed Cody grabbed her arm and grasped part of her jacket in one hand. Jordan then implies that Cody had been abusive to her in the past, stating, I thought, not again, not this time, I'm going to defend myself. She said she then pulled out of his grasp. At this point, Jordan admitted that she could have just walked away, but, quote, due to my anger, I put one hand on his shoulder and one hand on his back and pushed him from behind. As a result, he fell face first off the cliff, unquote. It was an accident, Jordan said, quote, it was a quick thing. I just wanted to get him off me. I don't feel like I killed him. I mean, I pushed him, but it was just an accident, unquote. After seeing him fall off the cliff, Jordan said it was a moment of complete shock and panic. But her panic didn't cause her to scream and or run for help. Instead, she walked back down the trail to the parking lot and drove home. She had the car keys in her pocket, which I guess was a lucky break for her, especially since we know from the surveillance camera that Cody had driven the car to the park. Hmm. She didn't report the so-called accident even afterward. During the search, when Cody's body was found, or in the time before or after the funeral. According to Jordan, she failed to do so because she was scared no one would believe her story. The investigator pointed out that she hadn't made any attempt to summon help after the tragic accident, even though they had evidence she had her cell phone with her that day and had even sent some text messages on her drive home. When Jordan Graham was told she was under arrest for murder, stoic as always, it was reported that she didn't even flinch. It was the first murder recorded in Glacier National Park's history. Jordan Lynn Graham was charged with first degree murder in the death of her husband, Cody Lee Johnson. She had been married for eight days. Faced with the possibility of life in prison, she pled not guilty. Her defense attorney would claim that Cody's death was a tragic accident as the result of an argument. Jordan Graham spent two months in jail and was then placed on house arrest and released into the custody of her parents. She was monitored by an electronic device attached to her ankle. She was also ordered to undergo a mental health evaluation and complete any treatment programs advised by mental health professionals. 
Her trial began in December 2013, almost exactly one year from the date that she'd accepted Cody's proposal of marriage. The case was held in federal court since the crime had taken place in a United States national park. Jordan was represented by Assistant Federal Defense Attorney Andrew Nelson. His opening statements portrayed Jordan as unhappily married and claimed that she and Cody argued frequently in the week after the wedding. Cody's fall happened because the couple was arguing on a steep and dangerous area of the hiking trail, and it had become physical, he told the jury. Yes, he conceded, Jordan had lied to police after the accident. He said she was a, quote, scared rabbit who was too terrified to come forward and tell the truth, so she created a web of lies. Kimberly Martinez, Jordan's friend, testified about the text messages she received from Jordan right after the wedding ended. She told how her friend had stated doubts about getting married and had become increasingly freaked out as she began running out of excuses for not consummating the marriage. Kim described Jordan as excited about planning the wedding and how she seemed happy right after the proposal, but said Jordan never wanted to talk about the actual marriage or the couple's future together after the wedding. She would get irritated, Kim said, when the subject was brought up. Cody's friends testified how happy he had been after Jordan accepted his proposal. He was infatuated with her, they said, but they saw the relationship as unequal in ardor. Jordan seemed to avoid spending time with her fiancé and mostly kept her distance, not showing much physical affection to him when they were together. Cody's mother, Sherry, also testified. Cody was her only child, and she was devastated at his loss. She had tried to share her grief with Jordan and comfort her after Cody's death, but said her daughter-in-law avoided her. She also testified at how happy Cody had been to marry Jordan. Through three days of heartbreaking testimony from Cody's family and friends, Jordan never displayed any sadness or remorse. It wasn't until her own brother, 16-year-old Michael, took the stand that she showed any emotion. Michael had looked up to Cody as a big brother. He was thrilled when his sister got engaged and enjoyed spending time with the couple and hanging out with his soon-to-be brother-in-law. He was as worried as everyone else when Cody went missing and volunteered to help in the search. He'd accompanied Jordan to Glacier National Park, and she'd led him to the trail and the drop-off point. He had been with his big sister when she discovered the body. Michael choked back sobs as he described seeing Cody's battered and lifeless body lying at the bottom of the canyon in his own sister's calm demeanor. She could have told us the truth, he said through tears. She told one lie, was asked to tell the truth, and she said it again. And she had to keep adding more lies to cover it up. And that's why I was so mad. As her brother testified, Jordan wiped away tears. However, she never apologized to anyone for her responsibility in Cody's death. On day four of the trial, Jordan changed her plea from not guilty to guilty of second-degree murder. The prosecutors made a deal to waive the first-degree murder charge and the additional charge of lying to investigators for her guilty plea. The testimony thus far had not been looking good for Jordan's defense, but there were other reasons why her attorney may have advised her to plead guilty before the trial concluded. First of all, prosecutors had filed court documents saying they had evidence that Jordan had also talked about killing her mother and stepfather in the weeks before the wedding. They were seeking to present this information at trial. Second, they also planned to bring in the theory that Cody had been the victim of a surprise attack by Jordan. They'd had the black cloth found near his body forensically tested. Human hair was discovered embedded in a knotted portion. It appeared that they were going to make a case that Jordan had planned and carried out the murder of Cody Johnson by luring him to the secluded spot and blindfolding him before pushing him to his death. Jordan Graham stood before the judge and agreed to plead guilty to the second-degree charge. She still claimed she and Cody had been arguing and he had grabbed her arm to keep her from leaving. She said in that moment she could have walked away, but due to her anger, she had pushed him instead, causing his death. Jordan Graham was sentenced on March 27, 2014. Standing before the judge once again, she gave an emotional statement saying she had no answers for why she didn't make a different decision that day. However, the day before she was to be sentenced, she attempted to withdraw her guilty plea. After agreeing to the plea deal, Jordan had read a court memo in which the prosecutors called the killing premeditated and were requesting she receive a sentence of more than 50 years. 
her motion to withdraw the plea was rejected by the judge. However, the judge wouldn't dole out the harshest sentence possible. Instead, Jordan was sentenced to 360 months, or 30 years in prison, followed by five years of supervised release. Her attorney filed an appeal in 2015, classifying Jordan's sentence as extreme. In 2016, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals filed a mandate affirming the court's decision to deny the request for a shorter prison sentence. She is serving her 30-year sentence at a federal prison in Aliceville, Alabama. Some final thoughts on this case. The question is why. Why did Jordan Graham, first of all, go through with the marriage to Cody Johnson, even though she'd expressed serious doubts before the wedding? And why did she feel her only way out of the marriage was through murder? Her defense attorney characterized Jordan as immature, and I would 100% agree with that assessment. Perhaps she had been too sheltered, or maybe her shyness and social awkwardness kept her living in a fantasy world of her own making. Her friends said she was excited and happy during the wedding planning, but never discussed her actual relationship with Cody or her hopes for her future marriage. Instead, she became annoyed and irritated when these topics were brought up. Like a little girl who fantasizes about a fairy tale wedding, but gives no thought to the actual real-life marriage, Jordan allowed herself to be caught up in bouquets and decorations and wedding songs but completely shed out the realities of being married until it was too late. Oh, and by the way, the wedding song that was written for the first dance, the one Jordan herself sang and recorded, well, the words to that song, in retrospect, were ironic and downright chilling. It included lyrics like, We climbed higher for a better view, to describe the new couple's future together, and You're my safe place to fall. Yikes. It was fairly obvious to all that knew the couple that Jordan showed no attraction toward her fiancé. Cody, it seems, was just a necessary detail for her fairy tale wedding. But in the days leading up to the wedding, reality began to sink in, and of course, her new husband was expecting an actual marriage, including a physical relationship, something that she had no interest in being part of. At this point, she could have made a lot of different decisions, as she put it later while pleading guilty. She could have spoken to her mother about her concerns and talked over her fears and nervousness about the wedding night. Or was she too immature to talk about sex at all? Another option, as her friends strongly encouraged her to do, was to talk to her pastor. And perhaps the couple could have received relationship counseling before the wedding. She did none of these things and instead continued to avoid the entire topic. Her behavior after Cody's so-called disappearance and after his death also paints a picture of someone living in an alternate reality. Jordan behaved as if nothing had happened, showing no emotion or even interest in the search or the funeral service. She also tried to wipe out every reminder of her relationship with Cody, throwing out all mementos of their time together. She made up a very unconvincing and childish scenario about what had actually happened in her fake email. There is no bother looking for Cody anymore. He is gone, the message starts. It ends with, he went for a little hike, and they are positive he fell and is dead, Jordan. So call off the missing person report. Cody is for sure gone. It reads as something that could have been drummed up by a fifth grader and would never fly in the real world. And yet, she seemed to believe it was all she needed to get off the hook with the police. She distanced herself from the reality of what she'd done, and from the fact that the person she'd vowed to honor and cherish till death do them part had died at her hands. She disconnected herself so well from the deed that she did not even react after returning to the site where Cody's broken body lay, was not emotionally present at his funeral, and never registered emotion, fear, or nervousness upon being interviewed by investigators. She was able to almost completely shut off her emotions, keeping them locked away and not allowing them inside the bubble of her own reality. It appears that neither being raised in a good family or the guidance of her faith could provide her with a moral compass or a conscience. And so, after the fairy tale wedding ended and she was required to step out of the fantasy and into the reality of married life, she instead chose to commit murder in order to continue existing inside her make believe world.
That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. I'm always interested to hear your theories on the cases presented on the podcast. You can join the discussion on the Once Upon a Crime Facebook page. You can also now follow me on Good Pods, where you can share episodes of the podcast with others and discuss them with me and other listeners. The live discussion with Dateline's Josh Mankiewicz on Good Pods has been rescheduled and will now be held this coming Wednesday, June 10th. You still have time to join us. Josh will be answering questions about his new podcast, Motive for Murder, and a live Zoom component has now been added. Good Pods is a new podcast social network where you can interact with podcasts and their listeners. I've included a link and information on how to join us for the discussion in the show notes. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Our research and production assistant is Lorena Garcia, and original music is by Aaron Michael Goldberg. Until next time, stay safe and be good to one another.